slide. Welcome everybody to um, the Astronomical Society of Edinburgh, our Friday night talk. Um, welcome to any visitors we have. Um, you can find out more about us on our website, Facebook page, Twitter, and all our previous talks uh, you'll be able to look at on the uh, YouTube channel. We have our own YouTube channel now. Thanks, Mark. And coming up <clears throat> on Wednesday next, we have uh, uh, talks uh, by Tosh, um, uh, Mike and Peter. Um, they're normally all scope talks, although Peter's decided to call his a shed talk. You'll have to tune in and find out why. On Friday, uh, we have another one of Bruce Vickery's really, uh, really good uh, historical perspectives, and it's James Bradley and others fact-checked. And another historical trip on Wednesday, the 1st of July, when Clive Davenhall will be talking about the Ludmark panorama. And on the 3rd of July, we have Dr. Rosa Santamarino, Martino, sorry, uh, the BioRock experiment. And as normal on the uh, first Wednesday of the month, there will be an imaging group meeting, but of course that will be for members only. If you want to join us, details are on our website. Thanks, Mark. So tonight's talk, um, Astro Navigation at Sea, I guess um, celestial navigation uh, was probably the oldest form of navigation we have. And the equipment was <clears throat> perfected over time um, to, um, to improve the accuracy of this application of astronomy. But of course, sadly, those bits of equipment uh, have just become old and interesting relics. Anyway, about our speaker tonight, um, Jim Anderson, um, a sailor, a member of the ASC, told me that um, he went up to Carlton Hill and looked through the Cook telescope as a child, and he was immediately hooked on astronomy. I've no idea when he started sailing, but I suspect we might hear more, more about that during the course of this evening. Um, questions in the normal way to Peter, if you're on Zoom, uh, in the chat box. If you're on YouTube and you're watching it live, please feel free to, uh, to type in any questions you have on the comments box. And with that, I'll hand over to um, Jim, all yours, Jim. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Thank you very much. And thank you, Mark, I think. Um, yeah, thanks for that introduction, uh, Andrew. I can actually start off by answering your question about when I started sailing. Um, it was in the very early 1980s when my wife and I, Jenny and I, um, discovered to our delight that, that sailing is not necessarily the eye-wateringly expensive pastime that it's very often understood to be. Um, and we bought a, a wee sailing dinghy exactly like this one for the princely sum of 150 quid and uh, learned the basics in her. And then let's go on, Mark. Uh, the next slide, yep. Uh, after five or six years, uh, we bought a wee yacht, and I mean a very wee yacht. She was only 19 feet from one end to the other. You can sort of get an idea of the size for the guy that's uh, sitting at the tiller, although he's sitting behind the mainsail. Uh, and she turned out to be an absolutely lovely wee boat. She was small enough to trail behind the car, and we went all over the place at her, and I was quite sorry to part with her when we eventually did sell her. Um, but then the, the kids flew the nest, and Jenny and I found that we had uh, a bit more time that we could spend together. So we were looking for something, we started looking for something which was a wee bit bigger, partly for comfort, um, partly so that she would be a bit more capable. And uh, we got our present boat, which I think is gonna come up. Yep, there she goes, and that's Jenny, of course. Um, we bought this boat, the present one, in 2004. And uh, here she is. I think we've got a photograph of her under sail coming up. Yeah, here she is under sail. She's a 26 foot um, masthead Bermudan sloop. That just means she's got one mast and two triangular sails that go right up to the top. And she's also got a 20 horsepower inboard diesel engine. So 
she's really quite capable. She's certainly more than capable of handling anything that I would choose to undertake. Uh, and she's quite comfortable. Can we go inside? Yeah, here we go. Um, this is breakfast with a couple of friends. You can tell by the expression on my face that it's morning. Um, we've got another one later in the day. I'm sorry about the delay on the slides. We were having a wee bit of, uh, of trouble with the, um, the presentation and Mark's having to share his screen instead of me sharing mine. Uh, anyway, here we are uh, later in the day. We're a bit more intimate. We're a bit more comfortable looking. Supper is just about to be served. Okay. Now, astro navigation. Here we go. Um, I'm guessing that for many of us, when this topic comes up, our reaction is pretty much what the, the slide depicts. Um, a little bit of a mysterious subject, a wee bit of a mystique about it. Um, maybe not very sure whether it's still relevant, whether it's still pertinent. Um, just what exactly is it? All sorts of questions. So what I've tried to do is to um, sort of structure this, this wee talk in four separate sections or distinct sections anyway. Can we go there, Mark? Oh, here we go. Um, yeah, relegation or renaissance. Just what is the status of Western navigation in the 21st century? Um, then what actually is it? What can it do for us? What do we need to do it? Um, how it works? What are the principles? Um, the theory, if you like, that it's based on. And then finally, what we do, how do we get from uh, that theory into the practical application and of getting a position uh, onto our chart? Okay, so relegation or renaissance. Are we going there? Yeah, here we go. Um, Remember to say next, Jim, like you said. <laughs> okay, Mark, I'll do that. Um, yeah, the, the, the question I think that, that uh, comes up in, in 2020 is, is astronavigation just an anachronism which ought to be consigned to the archives of history or um, at least to the province of the diehard traditionalist? And the answer to that question is both yes and no in that order. Uh, up to about the middle of the 20th century, there was really no alternative to astronavigation for finding a position in the open ocean. Uh, it's, it's all there was. And I suppose from the beginning of the 20th century, when radio communication started to be developed, uh, then the option started to crop up of using radio transmission stations, radio beacons, to to give a, a directional signal, but it was pretty rough and ready. It was a navigational aid. It certainly wasn't a navigational system. Um, and things remained pretty much like that till the Second World War. Um, a few systems were developed in the Second World War, mainly, it must be admitted, to guide bomber streams over a target. Uh, and they were quite successful, but they were susceptible to interference with the enemy. Uh, who could bend them or twist them or sometimes disable them altogether. And that maybe should have sounded a wee warning bell uh, for things to come, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, Post-World War II in the 50s and 60s, there was a great proliferation of different systems, different navigational systems. Um, inertial navigation uh, and Doppler navigation for uh, submarines and, and aircraft and surface ships, actually. Um, these were really, they weren't navigational systems in the sense that they would tell you where you were. They were more uh, very refined dead reckoning systems that told you where you'd got to. They just kept a very accurate record of where you'd gone from uh, the last time that you had a very firm position fix. So they did give you your position, but they'd worked it out from what you were doing rather than kind of starting from scratch and saying, here you are. Um, but they were around, there were uh, Decca and Loran, names you've probably come across. These were essentially coastal systems which worked from uh, shore-based radio stations. Uh, they, they, uh, they only really worked for a few miles offshore, quite a few miles offshore, but, but certainly no use for the open ocean, they didn't work out there. Um, so there were a, a big, good number of systems that developed. Um, but one thing that actually surprised me when I was just checking up on some dates, 
is that apparently transoceanic flights relied entirely on astro navigation right into the 1980s. Now that, that really did surprise me. I thought they would have had something else in place by that time, but apparently they, they, they didn't. Um, they may have been available, but they, they, it seems that they didn't use them. Um, so there we go. Now the whole navigational scene was changed completely, changed dramatically by the um, introduction of GPS in the late 80s and the early 90s. And that really did revolutionize navigation because you could go down to a local Chandler for 120 quid, you could buy a wee receiver, a wee bit bigger than a, an old fashioned mobile phone, not much. Um, and this would tell you your position anywhere in the world, originally to within about 200 meters. Later on, when the Americans switched off selective availability, the same we set would give you your position to within 10 meters. And they were stuffed full of software that did all sorts of clever things with the positional information that they had. And that made such a difference that the US Navy and common with some other um, world navies as well, actually discontinued training their deck officers in astro navigation around about 1996. I don't think it was a sharp cut off. I think they phased it out over two or three years, but it was around about that, that time, 96, 97. Uh, and so it remained until something happened in 2007, which, which made them think again. Actually, they should have had warning about this uh, from what I was saying earlier about the, the uh, enemy interference with World War II guide systems. But in 2007, China took out one of its own satellites, which had reached the end of its operational life. And that meant, of course, that the, um, the whole GPS system, which worked on a constellation of satellites, was vulnerable to that kind of attack. And uh, people realized that actually any navigation system that relies on, on signals uh, from outside the, the ship or the aircraft or whatever it is, is, is vulnerable to cyber attack, either hacking or distortion or interference or jamming or just plain taking the whole system out altogether. Um, so the US Navy obligingly reintroduced astro navigation into their officer training program and therefore into their, um, their little repertoire of navigational uh, techniques. R again, around about 2016, 216, 217, maybe it started as early as 2015. And so it's become um, a valid, important navigational um, system or technique or whatever we should call it uh, now in 2020. And of course, for a small boat at sea, which is really the, the kind of um, perspective that we're looking at it from tonight, it is absolutely essential. If you're going to set out on an ocean uh, passage, then you have to be absolutely able to be self-reliant if something goes wrong. And, um, it, it would just, I mean, a knockdown from a big wave that floods your electrics could take out all your electronic systems on board quite easily. And you're throwing back on a sextant and um, a digital watch and a great big stack of navigational tables. So there we go. Now, what is uh, astro navigation? Can we click to the next one, Mark, please? Yeah. Um, what is it? Okay, here we go, old man of the sea. Um, the, here we go using a sextant. I have got my own sort of working definition of this, which I compiled. Um, and what I, how I'd like to describe it, I think, is that it's a system for the determination of a position on the surface of the earth by measurement of the altitude of at least three celestial bodies, together with a very accurate measurement of Greenwich time and the most horrendously comprehensive set of navigational tables that you've ever come across. Um, so two things then, it, it depends on a sextant, which is a device for measuring the angle between two objects. It looks as if this guy's measuring the angle between this letterbox and his garage door, but uh, don't worry about that. Um, in Astronav, of course, the, the angle is between the celestial object and the horizon, so that's its altitude. It also, um, as I say, depends on a, a very accurate knowledge of Greenwich time. Now, there is a, a misconception around that astro navigation was developed so that we did not have to um, rely on, on Greenwich time, but actually it's the other way around. 
um, the people started to uh, research ways of determining very much time because of the development of astro navigation. It's that way around. And, and the tables are truly um, astonishing. I, um, well, let me just say that they, they will give you the altitude and the azimuth of the Sun, the Moon, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and 58 fixed stars for any position on the surface of the Earth, which is a whole number of degrees of latitude and degrees of longitude, for any second of the year. So they are quite comprehensive. Um, and I must admit, can we just flick to the next one, Mark, please? Next. Yeah. Um, here's a picture of the tables for what it's worth. Um, but I, I must admit that when, when I got to this stage of, of putting the top together, I found myself faced with a wee bit of a dilemma. Because handling a sextant and uh, applying all the uh, corrections that we need to uh, apply to, um, to get the actual altitude of the star from what the sextant reads on the one hand, and extracting data, learning how to extract data from these tables is a huge part of uh, astronavigation, either learning astronavigation, and this is not trying to teach you how to, um, how to navigate like that, it's a, an interest stop, not an instruction one, um, but either learning about it or actually applying it. And I was kind of faced with the, the, the dilemma of, on the one hand, kind of um, distorting what astronav feels like to handle and work with, and on the other hand, obscuring what uh, we're, we're trying to uh, look at, trying to explain, trying to explore with a great big mass of, uh, of detail. And I've come down on the side, on the side of just let's, let's go for clarity. Let's, let's treat handling a sextant and um, handling these tables as, as topics for a separate talk, maybe sometime in the future, and relegate them to pen, an appendix. But I do have some slides up my sleeve for this. So if you've got specific questions that you um, would like to ask, then please do uh, at, at the end of the talk. OK, can we go next, Mark, please? Here's a photograph of a sextant. OK, uh, I just put it in because it's lovely. We might look at it later on if anybody's got specific questions about it. Next. Yeah. Um, this is a wee diagram to just remind us of the information that we'll get out of these tables. What we measure with the sextant is the altitude of the star, yep, which is just the angle between the star and the horizon. And the other thing which we'll get from the tables is the, the azimuth. Sorry, I should say that again. We measure the altitude with the sextant. We get the azimuth from the tables. Okay, next please, Mark. So basically that's um, what astronavigation is. Uh, we, we're gonna use all that stuff to determine our position. We're gonna work with altitude. We're gonna work with azimuth. And how does it work? Next, please. Right, now before we look at astronavigation proper, I want to spend just a minute looking at a very um, well-known and basic coastal navigation technique called a three-point fix. Can we go next? Yeah. Now, it, it's interesting this. It's, it's a very common technique. It's used all over the place. Um, it's used by hill walkers and orienteers. If uh, you'd learn about it in the Boy Scouts, you'll have come across it. Uh, I'm sure if you've done a certificate of geography um, course at school, secondary school. Um, at sea, it's, it's, uh, it's, very, it's an excellent technique for navigating the desk from one side of a classroom to the other. Um, for every other practical purpose at sea, it, it, personally, I think it's about as much use as an ashtray and a motorbike, but we can talk about that at the end as well, if you'd like. But the way it works is that you identify three objects on the coastline, which are shown in the chart. They don't all need to be on the coastline. One of them could be a boy or something like that. But you identify three objects, and then you use a hand-bearing compass 
to measure the bearing from your boat to each of these marks and turn. Then you nip below, next please Mark, and you plot these onto a chart. And here's the first one plotted. So um, strictly speaking, it's the reciprocal bearing we, we plot, but you just turn the protractor upside down and save, it's a lot easier. Um, but anyway, um, here's the bearing line from one of the objects, it's a lighthouse in this case. And I hope it's self-evident that our position must lie somewhere along that line. We don't know where, but we do know that it's on the line somewhere. And so not surprisingly, this is called the position line. And I'm sure that most people, um, especially in a, 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 an astronomical gathering like this, will be very familiar with this idea. But it crops up in astronav as well. So let, let's just, uh, here it is. Now to get, to find out where we are in this line, we need the, the position line from another object. And we, can we get the next one, Mark? And here are the other two um, filled in. And again, I, I hope it's self-evident that our position is where these three lines intersect. It's the only point that's on, the, um, on all three of the lines. So there we go. Next one, please. Right, now, when we're on the Earth, of course, we specify position um, by means of latitude and longitude. And, and here uh, we, we have these lines. Uh, we've got the equator, we measure latitude north and south of that, of course. And we've got the prime meridian through Greenwich, and we measure longitude east and west of that. And this is showing the, uh, the, the latitude and longitude of Washington, DC. It would, of course, it's 39 degrees north and 77 degrees west. Um, next one. This is just another take on it, and I've included this image because it makes it very clear that latitude and longitude are actually angles. And I can tell you straight away just by looking at that, I mean, I know anyway because I put this together, of course, but I could tell you just by looking at that that New Orleans, which we're told there is a, a latitude of 30 degrees north, is 1800 miles north of the equator. And the reason that I could do that more or less off the top of my head is that the unit of distance that we use at sea, the nautical mile, which is slightly longer than a statue mile, it's about 2000 yards, um, it's actually defined as the uh, distance on the surface of the earth, which corresponds to one minute of latitude. So uh, one degree of latitude then is 60 nautical miles. Um, okay, so in this wee diagram, the, the 30 degrees of latitude north of the equator, where New Orleans is situated, it's just 30 degrees times 60 nautical miles, which is 1800 nautical miles, even I can do that in my head. And I've labored this point a wee bit because it, it introduces a very, very convenient equivalence, and that is that you can use um, minutes of arc and nautical miles interchangeably to express distance. Okay, can we go to the next slide, Mark? And then we've got the celestial pole, the celestial sphere as well, of course, which, uh, as you know, is a hollow sphere that's um, concentric with the Earth. Uh, we can drive a cosmic drinking straw from the, the South Celestial Pole through both geographic poles of the Earth and it will come out at the North Celestial Pole. The Celestial Equator is directly above the Earth's equator. If we stood on the, the equator of the Earth, then the Celestial Equator would be uh, right above us at the Zenith. Next one. And um, here's another view of the uh, Celestial Pole. And this time, somebody's painted all the wee stars on the inside, which is very convenient for us. So just if we can stretch our imaginations a wee minute, imagine that the, uh, these wee blobs of paint represent the stars are all still wet. And imagine that the celestial sphere now starts to shrink down until it's come right down and shrunk wrapped the surface of the earth, and then it expands back up to its original size. If that were to happen, then all these wee 
um, blobs of paint represented the stars would leave their mark on the surface of the Earth. And if I went and stood at one of these marks, then the star that made it would be directly above me. It would be at my zenith. And if I measured its altitude, then I would find that its altitude was 90 degrees. And when it came to position finding, I wouldn't actually have to go any further because I would be standing at what's called the geographical position of that star, which will be tabulated somewhere. Now, when we come to actually apply all this to celestial navigation, we don't need the geographic position of the star. We don't actually need to use it, but it is there. Um, and it would be a very quick way of um, taking advantage of that coincidence that I was actually standing right underneath the star. Um, in practice, however, next one, please. We don't find stars at our zenith. Uh, we uh, we find that the the altitude of the star is is less than ninety degrees. We're away from the zenith. Now, before um, you drown me out with holes of derision, um, or would you if you were not muted? I know that this diagram is wrong. Okay, it is utterly utterly outrageously out of scale. Um, the, the proper diagram, can we just show it, Mark? Next one. Yeah, here's the proper diagram of what, uh, what, what is really going on. But uh, let's go to the next one. Yeah, I hope you'll agree that, that this one makes it an awful lot easier to, to see what's going on. Um, here we are. We've measured the altitude of this star and the, the um, the, the writing here, the wee text, it tells us that we've actually measured it to be 40 degrees. Now, as a wee aside, it looks like a lot more than 40 degrees, but that's because the surface of the Earth is curved. Okay, so we'll, now that's going to be very important in a minute. Anyway, here we are. The, the altitude of the star is, is, is 40 degrees, and that means that it's 50 degrees away from the zenith. The zenith distance is 50 degrees, all right? If, we, um, if the star was at the zenith, its altitude would be 90 degrees. It's actually 40 degrees, so it's 50 degrees away from the zenith. And bearing in mind what I said a minute ago about the equivalence between angles and nautical miles, that means that I must be situated 50, times 60 nautical miles for each degree, which is 3,000 miles from the geographical position of this star. And so I could draw the circle on the diagram. I don't, I must be on that circle somewhere. I don't know where I would be on it, but I do know that I am 3,000 miles from the geographical position of that star, and therefore I must be somewhere on that circle. And actually, I could almost stop now. The, the, the principle on which Astronav is founded is as simple as that. The snag is, of course, that I don't know where I am on that position circle. It's called a position circle. I don't know where I am on it. And to find that out, then I need to measure the altitude of at least two more stars. Can we go to the next one? There we go. Um, and here it is shown. Uh, and I, my, the, the, a position circle for each star, and my position is where the three circles intersect, where the red dot is. And again, in principle, this is, I hope, very straightforward, getting on for being self-evident. The snag comes when we try to translate this principle into an actual plot on a chart. Can we go to the next one, Mark? When we, when we did our three-point fix, it was very easy. Um, the, the chart is nice and flat. It's a plain surface. And incidentally, that's the origin of the expression plain sailing. It's P-L-A-N-E, not P-L-A-I-N. Um, and, and navigating like that is a doddle. It's very easy to do, hence the origin of the expression. Anyway, when it comes to fixing a position, I can take the actual chart and I can plot these lines and I can put a, a, a dot with a circle around it on the point where I actually lie. 
usually I don't even have to worry about what the, the, the exact latitude and longitude of that is. I can just see what's going on in the chart. But that doesn't apply. Can we go back one mark? Yeah, that doesn't apply to uh, to this situation at all because these circles are on um, the, the surface of the Earth, which is spherical. And we're not talking about just slightly spherical. These circles could easily be 10,000 miles in diameter. So plotting it is just an on starter. Just to make the point, can we click forward two now? Yeah, just to make the point, um, somebody's plotted a couple of position circles on, on a, a flat map of the world. Not sure what the projection, the map projection is. It doesn't look like Mercator to me, but it doesn't matter. The important thing is that to get an area this size, um, which and we need something of this sort of order as a, an ocean chart, to get something on, a, on, on a, a chart that's covering this amount of the earth, you have to distort the land masses, you have to distort the shape of something wrong. And these um, are actually circles plotted on uh, a, a, a chart of, I don't know, maybe the projection, I don't know. Um, there's no way you could draw that, there's no way you could plot that in practice. So the kind of straightforward plotting with pencil and ruler, which works for a three-point fix, isn't going to work for astro navigation. And to do this mathematically is perfectly possible, but it involves spherical trigonometry, which really is, is probably beyond the um, resources of, of uh, uh, the, the typical navigator, with absolutely no disrespect to him. And even if it wasn't, it would probably take far too long to do it anyway. So we have to find another way, as they say. Can we go to the next slide? That's just to remind us what it is that we're looking at. And the next again. OK, we've arrived at um, what it is that we actually do. Now, there are a number of, over the, over the years, um, there have been a number of systems developed for uh, transferring a, a plot from the theory of the thing actually onto a plotted position. <coughs> Excuse me. But the one that's pretty much universally used at the moment was developed in 1875 by a French navigator called Marc Sangulaire. Um, and what he did was quite interesting. Can we go to the, the next slide? OK. <clears throat> what we set out to do was to use the altitude of a star that we've measured and the azimuth, which we've um, derived from tables, in order to find our position on the surface of the Earth. But we're not doing this because we're totally lost. I mentioned dead reckoning earlier on, and it's an absolutely standard navigational procedure to keep a dead reckoning plot from our last positional fix, from the last time we, we, we knew exactly where we were. Um, it's simply a record of the course that we steered and how far we've gone. For various reasons, that will not be our position. I mean, it's not that just it probably won't be our position. It definitely won't be our position because there are other factors um, influencing our course and our distance, like ocean currents and uh, leeway when the boats get blown sideways and things like that. Um, so the dead reckoning position will not be where we actually are, but it will be pretty close. Um, even if it's 50 or 100 miles out, when you consider that the position circles we were looking at a minute ago were 10,000 miles in diameter, possibly, um, then 50 miles or so is actually, you know, pretty close, a pretty good approximation. So what Sanilaire said was, OK, instead of instead of using the altitude that we measured and the azimuth that drops out from that to find our position, what if we took our dead reckoning position? and went to the tables to find out what the altitude would be and the azimuth would be of the star that we measured, if that's where we actually were. Okay, now I'll, I'll say that again. Instead of using the altitude that we've measured and the azimuth from tables to find out what our position is, what if we take our dead reckoning position which is pretty close to where we really are. And we use the tables to find out the altitude and the azimuth of the star we're working with 
at the dead reckoning position. Okay, can we go to the next one? And if we do that, we could draw a diagram like this. Um, the, there's a wee thing there marked assumed position. Uh, the, the position that we use is not actually the dead reckoning position. We choose a position near that, which is convenient for, for um, extracting data from the tables. You know, we, we choose it. It doesn't really matter as long as it's somewhere nearly really close by. Um, so it, we're working from a, an assumed position for this, only for this particular star site. Uh, and there it is. And the tables will give us the azimuth line so we can draw the azimuth line. Now, let me try and forestall a, a misunderstanding that might crop up in, the, in a minute or two. The azimuth of the star is only a direction. It's not a, a particular line. I've drawn a line in that direction through the star's assumed position, but the tables are not giving us that line. They're only giving us the direction in which to draw it. I could draw it anywhere on the, the uh, diagram but it would be perverse not to draw it through the assumed position. So that's what I've done. Okay, so there it is, there's the azimuth line. And I'm sorry, but I haven't actually marked the altitude in this diagram for some reason. Mark, could you just point it out for us, please? Yeah, that angle with the red dot in it is the, the star's altitude. Okay, but I know that's not where I am. So can we go to the next slide, Mark? Right, now this is the same diagram with a wee bit added. This um, second line that I've drawn in, the one that's to our side of the assumed position, is the one that is going through our actual position. Now, I don't know what that is yet, but that's what the line, um, that's what that line actually is. It's, it's uh, the, see the observed altitude in orange? Um, that's the, yep. That's the altitude of the, um, that I actually measured uh, between the star and the horizon. And there's something else which I know, and that is the difference. Well, I know the, the, the observed altitude. I also know the altitude that I got from tables, and I therefore know the difference between them. And in practice, that will be measured in minutes of arc. It, it, it will almost certainly be less than a degree. And remember this equivalence thing between a nautical miles and minutes of arc. Let's suppose that the difference in altitudes came out at 18 arc minutes. That tells me something that I dearly want to know, which is the length of that little line between the assumed position, yep, yeah, and where I took the sights from. If the, if the difference in these two angles is 18 minutes, then that line is 18 miles long. And therefore I could draw that diagram as well. And not only that, but I could draw in the position circle. Now I don't need to do that. I don't need to draw the whole circle, but I do, I, what I'm actually looking for is part of it so that I can get a position line on a plot. And even at that scale, remember that the, it's, it's hopelessly out of scale, the wee, the wee line is 18 miles long, the, the circles may be 10,000 miles across. Um, so, but even at that scale, if you look at the point of the position circle, which is crossing the, the, uh, the azimuth line, it, even from here, it looks not a million miles away from a straight line. So in the scale that actually applies, I can represent that with a straight line at right angles to the azimuth line, and nobody would know that I've made that approximation. Okay, so can we go to the next slide, Mark? Now, I, I hope, I really hope that I've managed to make this reasonably clear. If I haven't, it's my fault and not yours. But what I've done now is to transfer all this to um, a plot. What, what I've just uh, been, been talking about is theory really, um, this is this would be the beginning of an actual star plot. Um, we, we usually don't plot directly onto the chart. We usually do this on a plotting sheet, which is really just a, a glorified graph paper. So I've got a couple of axes here. The, the abscissa is the latitude. 
okay? And uh, I've marked that in at 52 North because, sorry, I should have said this at the outset, um, my, my assumed position here is 52 degrees north, 13 degrees, 27 minutes west. Um, that, 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 these figures have, have got really nothing to do with this wee plot, um, but, but that's what they are. So I would, I would draw in the, um, the, the latitude axis uh, at 52 north, and the longitude axis, uh, I would make that a whole number of degrees as well, and in this case, obviously, it's 13. Okay. And I can mark on it, I can now mark on this chart my assumed position. Remember, it's a, it's a position of chosen latitude and longitude. And the position is 52 north, 13, 27 west. Okay. So the distance of that uh, assumed position from the, the longitude axis is 27 minutes, uh, 27 miles, in other words. Okay, now I can draw the azimuth line through the assumed position because the azimuth line is just the compass direction of the star um, measured in degrees round from north. So um, the, the angle, Mark, could you stick your wee red dot on the angle between the longitude axis and the azimuth line? For yeah, and no, nope, wee bit right. Go left, no, up a bit, slightly right. It's that angle anyway. Okay, that's it. Yeah, stay there. It's that angle there. That sounded, that, that felt like the whole shot for a minute. Um, that gives your age away. Uh, but, but there we are. So that, that angle is the, the azimuth of the star. I can draw uh, a line in that direction through the assumed position and the, the distance from the assumed position to the, the position line. Sorry, I'm pointing at the screen. I'm getting carried away. Uh, can, can you do that for us, Mark? Could you just point, yeah, from the assumed position down to the position line, down the azimuth line. You okay, can you go, that's it. That distance there, the wee bit of the line that Mark's moving on, that distance is the 18 nautical miles that are represented by the 18 minutes difference in the, um, the, the altitude that we got for our assumed position and the altitude that we actually measured. And that is actually it. Okay, now the trouble with this is that when you talk about it and try and explain it, it makes it sound more complicated than it is. So um, I, I, I can only hope that I've, I've, uh, I've managed to make it reasonably clear. But that is actually um, a star plot for one site. And if we flick to the next one, yeah, uh, here is a, an actual plot for three stars. When I say it's an actual plot, it's, it's obviously an exercise, but, um, <coughs> excuse me again. But um, this is an astronaut plot um, for three stars. I, they, there are three assumed positions because we took this, we would have to take the plots at three different, sorry, take the altitudes at three different times. You can't, um, you can't look at three stars at once through your system. So the, the first one that was taken there is, is the one that Mark's marking. And you'll see it was taken at um, two minutes and 25 seconds past six o'clock in the evening, 18.02.25. Um, the, the tables for uh, the assumed position, which was a latitude 43 south. Okay, that's that big heavy dotted, that's it. And it looks like, uh, what? Fifth, something like 57, what, that'd be 57, 56 degrees east. Yeah, very much got his dot. Um, the azimuth was in the direction of that line, the one that Mark's got his dot on now. And there it goes, up the required distance, that, that distance, the length of that line, in other words, is the discrepancy between the observed altitude and the, um, the, the calculated altitude from the tables. And then the position line's drawn at right angles to that. And, and let me just emphasize again, the azimuth line is not a position line. It looks as if, oh, hello. There we go. Um, it looks as if it ought to be um, there's a kind of intuitive logic that, that makes us want it to be, but it's not. It's only the direction. Okay, so the line with the two arrow heads is the actual position line. We go to the next plot, 1802.58. Exactly the same thing. We need to choose a different assumed position here because it's been taken at a different time. We need to choose a position that works for the tables. Um, uh, and this one does. Uh, I've, I've you know, I've deliberately refrained from showing you how we do that, um, but you can ask about it if, you, if you'd like to. Uh, so there we go, it's 1802.58. Um, can we draw that line 
that has a mid line down now. Yeah, that's it. And, and then that big line at right angles to it is the position line for the second star. And then I don't think we need to uh, labor through the, the point in the doubt, but the next plot at 180320 is yet another assumed position as a mid line almost straight up. And the, um, the position line for that gives us that the intersection of the three or they nearly intersect, that, um, ladies and gents, is where we are. And we would read that latitude and longitude just off the, 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 the plotting sheet and transfer it onto the chart. And actually, I think that's it. Now, I'm sure that there are going to be questions arising, I ho actually hope there are, um, out of things that I uh, that I haven't explained, deliberately haven't covered. And I'm afraid that there'll be questions arising out of things that I haven't made clear. Uh, but I'm going to hand over now to Peter, I think it is, is it, who's, who's going to manage that. And I'll do my best to answer anything that you've, you've got. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jim. That was uh, excellent. I, I, it reminds me of why I didn't study it. Anyway. <laughs> was that as bad as that? I'm sorry. <laughs> Not you, the subject. We have some questions and some uh, contributions, I would call them. Sean, can you ask your question first? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, Jim. That was fascinating. Um, it was really a question around, I suppose, the conditions of being at sea uh, in terms of the pitching and rolling of a, of a ship, um, you know, atmospheric conditions. How, how accurate were sextants in terms of getting an accurate fix for the altitude of a, of a star or various stars, particularly if you were dependent on, um, you know, if you were various latitudes where sea conditions and weather conditions might often be very um, um, might have to be very difficult to deal with. Yes, um, that actually is, is it's a, that's an excellent point. Um, the, uh, there's another question just come in. Obviously, you've got to be able to see both the horizon and the star. Um, so you're limited to roughly the period of nautical twilight, so about 20 minutes. Um, that's, that's more answering a, a question that just came in in text there. Um, at, at dusk and dawn, um, the the accuracy, the, the sextant itself will be calibrated in either tenths of a minute of arc or um, or two tenths of a minute of arc, and you would expect a decent navigator to be able to read it to within a minute of arc. Now, the can the um, the conditions, the accuracy, of the actual sight. You're absolutely right. It depends on a whole stack of factors. One is how clear the horizon is. If the horizon's a bit hazy, um, then you don't have a clear datum from which to measure your altitude. If, if um, sea conditions are, are heavy, if there's a big swell running, then um, you, you run into a problem over an, a sextant correction called um, height of eye, dip. Um, you, you're actually uh, sitting a wee bit above sea level even in a calm sea, um, when you're making your altitude measurement. And that means you're, you're kind of looking over the horizon a wee bit. So the altitude, the, the, the angle between the horizon and the star is a little bit more than the altitude. It's only a couple of arc minutes, but you do need to allow for it. Because remember, any an error of one arc minute and your altitude throws your position over a mile. Um, if you've got a big swell running, it, it's quite tricky to um, to, to estimate the height of eye because the you'll only see the horizon from the top of a wave. So you have to estimate the wave height and then half it and add that to your height of eye. So that's a second uh, thing which makes life difficult. The third thing that, that, makes, that, that, that makes life difficult is just as you say the motion of the boat, but actually that's not so much of a problem as you'd expect it to be. Um, because with a sextant, everything's moving together and you know, you, you can, within reason, you can sort of huddle the sextant all over the place while you look through it, and the, the star will still uh, rest on the horizon. It, it won't, the, the star on the horizon won't wobble about. Um, it's, that's one of the reasons why this works as well as it does. Um, Uh, 
Uh, yeah. That's better. Does that go somewhere to answering your question, Sean? Yes, uh, it, it does. Thanks. It was the. It was the. As you say, it's the um, uh, not being familiar with how 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 accurate it is when you look through a sextant. It's. It. It was. I was just really fascinated to know how 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 difficult it was in practice mm -hmm. to to get accurate readings uh, within the window of opportunity you had. Yeah, it's quite. Normal. The the one thing that that that, um, that, that uh, you didn't mention, but it is actually a difficulty, and that's cloud cover which can make it difficult to identify the stars, obviously. Um, but that's not as much of a problem as you'd expect it to be because you, what you tend to do is as much of the preparation as you can in advance. When you come to the, um, the actual taping of the site, then you, you should already have looked up the altitude that you expect to find and you preset that on your sextant. So when you look at the star um, through the, the, the sextant, you expect to find it sitting on the horizon. Um, and if it's not, you've probably got the wrong star. So th there, there are all sorts of things that you'd expect to find as difficulties, which are actually not as much of a problem as you'd expect in practice. But there are also things that you'd expect to be straightforward, which are an absolute nightmare in a small boat. I, I, I suspect, Jim, this is, this is part of the art rather than the science, isn't it? The use it of is. a sextant is an art. What yes. you're doing is applying the science with it. it, it yes, you're, you're absolutely right. And navigation, um, Navigation is a subject, is a science, but but any kind of navigation when you're applying it is an art. I mean, I, I, I was moaning about a three-point fix earlier on. Um, it all falls to bits when you get to sea because you hardly ever find three objects. <laughs> and if you find two, then you probably find that the, the two objects in the boat all lie on the same straight line, so you kind of use them to get a fix anyway. Um, and, and, and sometimes you actually have to make do with one. Um, so you have to grab whatever you can get and, and doing that and, and building it into a navigational picture is an art, but it's an art which applies a science. It's, it's, I, I find it fascinating, I love it. Sorry, I apologize. The, the noise was a video of me almost falling into the water engine when I was sailing through some rough seas that I thought would illustrate um, Sean's point very nicely. But it's a bit of atmosphere. There's right. no way so anyway, to... any, and Graham Rowe made a comment, but I think Graham, it's probably been addressed, is it? Uh, yes. Now I've never experienced this personally, but um, I I do I have heard from a number of sources that the Navy quite often conduct exercises in the minches um, when they the the Jan GPS they they uh, they don't they don't take it out. What they do is they twist it. They 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 kind of interfere with the signals so that they they have great big errors in in the position, um, and and that's exactly the sort of thing that that we were talking about at the start of the uh, the talk. Um, it's it's usually not so bad because the errors are usually something like forty miles. So you know you know there's if you know if you have noticed that you're forty miles away from where you thought you were, then you know there's something seriously wrong. Um, so, so you know, but the fact remains, your GPS for the for the duration is is useless. You just have to watch out for the announcements on the radio. <laughs> they don't always tell you. <laughs> Anybody else got any questions in the members, or shall we pop over to YouTube, Mark? Just a quick question. For me, Jim, thanks. That, that was fascinating. I didn't realise there was so much to it, and I guess I hadn't really considered how it all worked. But um, just the, the thought of one person using the sextant to do all the, the checking and someone else drawing the stuff on the chart, how long does it take to do that to figure out that you aren't yeah. where you thought you were? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, what most people try and do for the actual star sites <coughs> excuse me, um, is to have uh, one person take at the site and another person uh, noting the time of each site. Because you have to get that to the second, an error of four seconds in Greenwich Mean Time um, for, for, for the time when you took the site, an error of four seconds in that uh, throws your position out by a mile. Uh, so you, you need to do that pretty um, pretty quickly and, um, and also pretty accurately. So the, the trick is to read the seconds first and then the minutes and the hour. Um, but you you should be able to 
to shoot about seven stars in about 15 minutes. The, the tables, for, for a given position, the tables will give you data on seven stars, which are not only visible, but they're, they're good stars to, um, to use. Um, and as I say, so, so maybe two minutes a star. Um, actually reducing this site, as it's called, would take about another half hour, I should think. So you, you, um, you would expect to have the, the position on your chart within about three quarters of an hour of starting to take the site. And that's absolutely fine on the ocean, of course. You know, the, you got a fix for where you were three quarters of an hour ago. That's pretty good going. It's a long time. That, to that Thank you. Question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, it's a long time since I've seen the tables, Jim. Have you got a copy of a table there just to show us? Um, well, yeah. Can we go to Mark right down to the bottom for the yeah? For yeah. Uh, can you do another one? These are the correction. Okay, just flick back to that one for a second. <coughs> back one more. Yeah, um, these, uh, I know this is probably not what you were asking, Andrew, but the, these are the tables that you use to correct the, the sextant readings to give you your altitude. Um, the, the, the column mark dip gives you the, um, the correction that you need to allow for your height of eye above the water. And, and you'll see that it's, uh, for, for us, it would be uh, maybe about six feet, which is 2.4 arc minutes, and it's negative, you take it away. Um, for a, a super tanker that's maybe 100 feet, bridge 100 feet above sea level, um, it might be as much as about five minutes of arc, maybe even slightly more. So it's not a big thing, but it does, it makes a difference. You know, you're talking about several miles. And the, um, the middle thing for stars and planets is, uh, the, the corrections for atmospheric refraction. Um, <coughs> I'm sorry, my voice is going. Um, it's zero at the zenith, of course, for an altitude of 90 degrees. And it's a maximum um, of about five minutes of arc uh, down near the horizon. But again, you would take these away from the, the, the sextant readings. Sorry, I know that's probably not what you were asking. Can we keep going, Mark? Can we keep going? Yeah, we'll, we'll just, yeah, here we go. Yeah, um, I just, Jim, I just remember my brother who was a deck officer. Uh, ah. He had his Nicholson's guides and his endless reams of tables. <laughs> and I used reams to say, how do reams. you make sense of this? Uh, yeah, well, you, yeah, um, that's, that's what I was saying. It, it, it is actually both in terms of learning about it and in terms of applying it. It's, it's, the, dominant, um, it's the dominant aspect. It's the dominant component in, in astronavigation is handling all these tables. But... It's it's not so difficult once you once you find out where to look. <clears throat> um, these ones there are giving what what you're actually looking for is your position um, relative to the celestial sphere. So you're actually looking um, not at longitude but at hour angles. And the the you for for um, the time of the observation, um, you see that, that, that each page here covers three days in hourly increments. Um, and the, the, the left-hand column, the extreme left-hand column gives you the time. The next column is the Greenwich hour angle in minutes and in, uh, degrees and minutes uh, of the, the first point of Aries, which is obviously the reference on the, uh, on the um, celestial sphere. So, so you only, all you have to do is to find that page of the tables um, for, for your time, and then there's another supplementary one. I don't know if I've got that, Mark. Could you flick over and see the next one? Yeah, um, here it is. Uh, this just gives you increments in minutes and seconds um, to allow you to interpolate. Um, so so it's, it's very easy to go into the tables and get the, the, the Greenwich hour angle of Aries. Um, what we actually need to, to work out our data on the star is the local hour angle of, of, of the Aries, which is again the hour angle between you um, and uh, the, the first point of Aries, and that orients the whole thing with respect to what you're doing. Could you flick it up once more, Mark, please? Yeah, just keep on that wee thing. Um, the, the, the local hour angle uh, that we're looking for is the blue angle there, and you see it's very easy to get it. You just, um, the, the Greenwich hour angle is shown in orange, the local hour angle is shown in blue, and the, um, the difference between the two is the observer's longitude. Um, which is in green. And, and that's why you choose a, a, a particular position um, as your assumed position. 
because the, the tables only um, a provide values for local hour angles in whole integer um, values of the local hour angle. It's got to be a whole number of degrees. So you fiddle your longitude so that when you take your longitude away from the, 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 um, the Greenwich angle, you get a whole number. It sounds, it sounds much more complicated than it does. It's actually, I, to be honest, when I started out this talk, I didn't realize how difficult it was going to be to explain it without being able to, um, to point at things and to build diagrams up as we were doing them. But, um, but there we go. Next, could you just do the next slide from Andrew? Yeah, here we go. Um, so the uh, table here, there's, there's a page for, um, for every degree of latitude. Um, the local hour angle is down the extreme left-hand side. And then you've got seven stars there, you see. And um, the, the calculated altitude, which is what HC means, is given in degrees and arc minutes. And the azimuth in degrees is given as well. So you just read it off. So when once you know, once you've got familiar, once you know what you're doing, and once you've got all your angles and, and readings and everything else corrected, um, and you worked it out in advance, you only have to look up these two values in the tables and um, and Bob's your uncle. Uh, it even tells you which stars to look at. Uh, the ones with the wee diamond on them are the ones that will give you the best cut in the position lines. The reason why I, I wanted to, uh, I knew you had some of these slides, uh, Jim, but, but to bring us back to our astronomy, uh -huh. is what drove a lot of impetus in astronomy. Absolutely, yes. Years, wasn't it? To derive these tables. Absolutely. This is what it was all about. Absolutely. Um, yes, I, I mean, it was, it was navigation. It was actually trade and therefore navigation. Um, which which drove all the work that um, Bruce was telling us about a, a, a couple of weeks ago in his talk. Um, 60,000 stellar uh, observations, wasn't it? And, and Halley, something similar. Um, and it was all to produce tables like them. Thanks. Andy. Incidentally, somebody popped up a question. Um, it wasn't a question, it was a comment um, to, uh, to say that uh, the Apollo uh, programs used sextants uh, for astronavigation um, in the moon missions, they did. And in fact, in Gemini 12, Buzz Aldrin used the sextant to dock uh, with the Agena probe, which was the object of the mission. Um, but these work on an entirely, I mean, they still work uh, by measuring angles between stars, um, but they and the Hubble telescope and things like that uh, actually work on a completely different um, it's completely different geometry. It's a, it's a different theory. And the sextants look nothing like each other either. I mean, the, the Apollo sextants are fearsome looking thing. Thanks, it was me, I'll say. Go ahead, yeah. Anything Could you explain to us the sextant, uh, Jim? Say again? Could you explain to us the sextant? Right, that works. I will, if you'd like me to. Yeah, by all means, if you'd like me to. Do, do, do you want to go to the diagram? Back, back, back another one, back another two. Yeah, here we go. Um, yeah, the, what we've got basically is a, a sighting telescope, which we obviously look through. And in front of that, there's a mirror, which is literally half silvered, half of it's silvered, the rest of it's clear glass. So when you look through the telescope, you can look straight through this uh, mirror at the horizon. Um, and it's called the horizon mirror, in fact. Um, but you also see a, a light from a second object via the other mirror, which is called the index mirror. And light from the object is reflected in the index mirror, reflected to the horizon mirror, to the silver part, and it's also reflected through the sight telescope. So when you look through the sight telescope, you see both objects at once. And what, uh, what you do, the, the movable arm, on which the index mirror is mounted can swivel um, along that scale, change the angle of the index mirror, and basically what you do is to adjust that movable arm until the two objects are seen in the sight telescope side by side. Um, it, if you're using this for astronavigation, it's not only used for astronavigation, it's used in all, all sorts of things in navigation, but in astronavigation, what you'd be uh, looking at then is the, the star or whichever body you're using sitting on the horizon. Um, 
and then you just read the, the altitude, you read the angle of the movable scale. Um, but it's worth flipping to the photograph as well. Is that clear so far, by the way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, is that okay? Um, the photograph kind of adds, adds the bits that, that make it work. Um, first of all, and incidentally, there's some things there that look like old fashioned 35 millimeter slides. Can you see them? Can you, can you maybe point to them, Mark? Yeah, there. Um, these are, these are um, shades that you can flick over in front of the mirror because um, as astronomers, we, we know that, that looking through a, a telescope directly at the sun, which we would quite often do in Astronav, is a definite no-no. So you, you just flick these shades over to cut the light down. And there's some in front of the horizon mirror as well. Um, okay, so that, that's, that's, uh, that's incidental. Um, but if you look below the scale, yeah, um, I think you can, you can see in the photograph, you can see some gear teeth there. Um, and that's a worm wheel, exactly like the, the worm wheel on the polar axis of uh, an equatorial telescope. Um, and the, it's connected to the worm, which is driven by that little micrometer drum thing, which Mark's got his, his pointer on now. Um, so when you rotate the drum, it, 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 it's a kind of slow motion for the index arm backwards and forwards on the scale. And the drum, the, the micrometer drum is calibrated in minutes of arc. And you'll see there's a vernier on it as well, which will give you to you know, subdivide the, the actual minutes. Um, so that you can move the arm quickly, there's a, a wee catch there, a uh, couple of buttons it looks like. Um, if you just press them together, it disengages the worm so you can make course adjustments to the index arm and get it roughly right and then sort of fine tune it with the micrometer drum. Um, and as I say, that should give you, 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 in fact, it needs to give you your altitude to within a minute of arc. Is that okay? Is that, does that leave any Good. bits? Yeah. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Excellent. Any more questions on YouTube or? Um, is that done handheld? I mean, you often see yeah. them in the films uh, holding them by hand, but that seems um, like it would uh, move up and down as you're trying to measure it. The sextant, is it? Yes. Holding the sextant by hand, yeah. Um, yes, it will move. It will move all over the place. Um, but the great thing about the sextant is that the whole, the whole shebang, the, um, the telescope and both mirrors, all move together. And the... Um, the, the, the relative position of the two objects only depends on the angle between the two mirrors. So you could actually take the telescope, bring a star down to the horizon, and then wave the telescope all over the place, um, and, and the star would sit quite firmly in the horizon. You might have a bit of a job um, getting it there if the, if the sextant is unsteady as that, but uh, one, it, it doesn't, it's not like a compass swinging. It, 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 once you've got the thing there, it stays there. Um, I was going to say something else about that. <laughs> uh, yes, um, what is important is that the sextant has to be vertical at the time that you take the reading. Um, so, so what you actually do um, is to bring the star down to the horizon and then you rock the sextant gently from side to side. And that causes the star to pendulum across the horizon and you adjust it till it just grazes it in the middle of its swing. There's actually a wee gif thing there, but I'm not sure if it's worth showing that. That's the art piece. Aye, that's right. <laughs> Hi, Jim, it's Andrew. Could I just ask, um, I'm interested in this aviation application of this, and aircraft up until quite recently would have a little astrodome built into the roof of the aircraft so the guy could pop his head up and, and take uh, bearings. But I'm wondering how it works that the aircraft may not be pitching as much as your boat will, but it's certainly going faster and you may not be able to see the horizon. So how would it work for them? Absolutely. John Murrell's, actually, John Murrell's just anticipated your question. Um, you, you, in, in air navigation, you use a thing called a bubble set. See, the other, the other factor, uh, which, which you didn't mention, is that your, 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 um, your altitude is so great. I mean, the height above the, uh, the, the ground is so great um, that the, the dip correction would be enormous. Um, so in, in air navigation, you use a thing called a bubble sextant, which works with an artificial horizon. Um, you can actually use an artificial horizon with an ordinary sextant. Um, I've never seen it done, but 
uh, what you do is you get a, a bowl of liquid. Um, water, water's a bit too uh, thin to do it. It's, it's, it's not viscous enough, but oil or something works well. Um, and what you do is you, you, you catch the, um, the reflection of the star in, the, um, in, in the, the, the bowl of oil or whatever you're using. And then you bring the star down to touch its reflection. And the reading on the sextant then is twice the altitude. But, but as I say, aircraft have, have a proper bubble sextant that works on an artificial horizon. It usually is, um, is a, a, an angled mirror suspended on a filament, but, but I, I wouldn't be able to go there and explain how it works. You need a, you need a diagram. Anyway. Yeah, that's fine, thanks. Excellent. Any more questions? Or yeah, we... I've got a couple of a uh, couple of wee things, Andrew. Where are we? Um, I forgot where I was. Yeah, um, going right back to the very start um, when they had the, you had the shipping forecast on. I did a, a trip on the Winston Churchill across the English Channel, and the watch officer always chalked down the um, forecast, shipping forecast. And there was absolute silence while he was doing that. Uh, but also there was a periscope on the Winston Churchill. Uh, this was in 1993. And we were able to do plain tabling, um, picking up the lizard. But of course, it was always an upside down image. Talking yeah. Images. I've, I've lost out. Oh, there we are. <laughs> yeah. So we've, we've done plain tabling at scout camp as well. It's, it's a bit of fun. Yeah, sorry, I, I I missed your question. I think was was that? Did, did no, you have something more, more, oh, okay. yeah. more more of a comment. All right, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yes, yeah. Navigation's great fun, actually. It's uh... yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, did we have anything from um, from YouTube? Question wise, Mark. No, YouTube's been particularly quiet tonight. Actually, there's quite a few people, <laughs> quite a few people on it, but the, the, it's been oh, quite good. quiet. That's tonight. fine. Look, look, Jim, um, that was brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, an exceedingly really difficult, a difficult subject Being to done. talk about. Um, <laughs> it's all yeah. in the doing, isn't it? It is indeed all in the doing. Yeah. Yes, it is. Um, and they, you know. Thank you for your appreciation, but an awful lot of credit has got to go to Mark. Um, <laughs> he he was incredibly patient. I am just not comfortable with this technology, I'm afraid. Um, in fact, as I've said to Mark often enough, I'm not comfortable with any technology that hasn't got a boiler in it somewhere. Um, <laughs> but uh, he, he's gone to an awful lot of work and exercise, an awful lot of patience in, in getting this to go. And of course, he had to take over the screen presentation because I think we had the same sort of problem as Bruce did a couple of weeks ago. Um, so, so thanks to Mark for, for all the, the effort that he's put into this. No, wonderful, thank you very much for all it. No, uh, Jim, it's taken a lot of effort from you as well, and we yeah. really appreciate it. Mark did well to navigate his way around. <laughs> and Jim, do you have a sextant on board your yacht? I think this is the point to make a confession. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mark, can we go back to the... Um, to the, the, the shot, hey, wait a minute, it's slide. Can you go back to the one of the guy with the sextant at the garage door? Quick, quick as you can. <laughs> yeah, we're nearly there. Yeah. There, him, yeah. Um, the confession is that I have never handled a sextant in anger in my life, and this <laughs> is not me. But it's not a bad likeness, and I couldn't resist including the image of it in the thing. Um, I, uh, I have handled sextants. I've just never never had to use them for uh, for astronauts. I've, I've handled sextants, and I've used the tables to reduce sight, but I've never had uh, I've never had occasion to put the two together. So there you are. That's confessions of a failed um, <laughs> astronaut. Oh, You'd well. be pleased to hear that he does actually have whiskey on his boat, though. So. Oh, that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> I used to a have great substitute. In the boat. Sorry? I said whiskey is a great substitute for a sextant. It, it is indeed a great substitute for a sextant, yes. Um, the pleasure is longer. Two, 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 two things. I, 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 I'll make a comment. Um, 
Well, one is my 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 brother, um, as I say, used to used to do this, and and they used a deck in a decker navigator, uh -huh. which pr produces a series of concentric lines. And yeah, but, uh, he said the idle navigators used to sail down the line, which was I, fine I, until somebody came the other way. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the same thing used to happen in, in the early days of GPS. Um, people would um, enter buoys as, yeah. as waypoints, you know, and and they had a whole spate of, of um, situations where um, the yachts were sailing straight into the buoys. This was yeah. this was after the the US took selective um, availability off, so so people had to learn to start entering their waypoints a few hundred yards away from the buoy. Excellent. Um, thanks, Jim. That was that was really good. Um, and I've, I've had some good news in tonight. I uh, speculatively sent an email to NASA. I'm quite interested in the Parker Solar Probe, and I saw uh, the latest update. So I emailed them, and uh, I, I emailed Sarah Fraser and said, "How about a talk?" <clears throat> Whilst you were talking, Jim, she came back and said, uh, thanks for reaching out. I'm asking around to see if we can find someone from the mission team to speak to us. Stand by. So hopefully in July, we might get a talk from NASA. Brilliant. So uh, Brilliant. you never know your luck. Very good. OK. Well, thanks, everybody. And um, unless there's anything else anybody's got to say, I'll uh, see you on Friday. I'll see you next Wednesday.